everybody. Good evening. First, I just want to say this is remarkable. At almost every single seat is filled, and I want to say thank you. I think this is a really, really wonderful beginning, really, to not only the term, but also this, this lecture series that we have planned for you. And it's a real testament to, I think, how, how much um, the students talked last year about getting out of uh, these lecture series. Wait, sorry, that didn't make sense. <laughs> Syntax all wrong. We'll start here. Um, so for those of you who don't know me, uh, my name is Tara Bissett. So I'm a, a, an instructor here. And um, I welcome you to our first uh, lecture in the winter, or the, sorry, the uh, 2023 Ariscraft Canada Brick Lecture Speaker Series. Our title is From the Field. But first, what I'd like to do is acknowledge the lands that we're um, gathered on. We are located on the traditional lands of the neutral Anishinaabe and Haudenosaunee peoples. The university where we gather today is situated on the Haldeman Tract, the land granted originally to the Mohawk of the Six Nations, and this includes 10 kilometers on either side of the Grand River since 1794. The Six Nations people came here in exile from their traditional lands in New York State and are currently our neighbors on this site. And I'd like to thank Bill Woodworth, uh, whose words I have in part echoed tonight in preparing the land acknowledgement. So as I said, this is the first lecture from the 2023-24 Waterloo Architect Architecture Lecture Series. This series explores the field and the idea of working in and from the field. Field work is unique in that it requires hands-on processes that are entangled in the spatial, the material, and the cultural matters of place, people, and site. So that means that when we anchor spatial, spatial research and design as field work, we close the gap between speculative design and the practice of everyday life. So our title of this lecture series, From the Field, reflects this feedback loop that occurs when we stop to consider how local conditions stakeholders and agents play a meaningful role in shaping not only our design, but also our studio practices. So the speakers of this year's lecture series are all operating in different ways in the field. And I'd like to thank our planning committee for the lecture series, uh, Lola Shepard, Jalia Fonseca, Fiona Lim Tung, and Anwar Jabber. Thanks as well to Eva Sabourin, for designing the poster and to Ariscraft Canada Brick for funding this lecture series. I'm going to ask Lola Shepard to come up in a minute to introduce our speaker tonight, Marie Law Adams. But first, a word about Lola. <laughs> uh, probably doesn't need much of an introduction, but I'll, I'll do it anyway. Uh, Lola Shepard is a professor here at the University of Waterloo and is also a founding partner uh, together with Mason White of Lateral Office, a Toronto-based architecture practice. Lola is committed to design as a research vehicle to pose and respond to complex, urgent questions in the built environment, engaging in the wider context and climate of a project, social, ecological, or political. For the past 15 years, Lateral Office have been pursuing research and design work on the role of architecture as a tool of cultural empowerment in rural and remote regions, working closely with First Nation and Inuit partners. Lola has authored many writings, including Many North, sorry, Many Norths, <laughs> Spatial Practice in a Polar Territory. So we welcome Lola. Um, thank you all, and let me echo Tara's comment. This is, um, I don't know, in 17 years of being in the school, I don't think I've seen uh, an Aris Craft lecture this full, so it's really um, heartening and lovely to see you all here. Um, so I'm delighted to um, introduce Marie Law Adams, um, whose work I've gotten to know over uh, several years. She's a co-founder of Landing Studio, based in Boston, and associate professor of architecture at Northeastern University. Landing Studio was formed in 2005 with the Rock Chapel Marine Project, which I 
she may share, um, which was a shared road use terminal and public park in an industrial neighborhood of Boston. While working with this community in their first decade of practice, Landing Studio studied production and um, studied salt production facilities across the globe, learning how seemingly standardized spaces of production and infrastructure could be shaped by local people and places. This understanding served as a foundation for their ongoing work to bring local voices, new dimensions of human delight and comfort and natural systems to infrastructural spaces. The work of Landing Studio has received honors such as the Architectural League's Emerging Voices Award, the Architectural League Prize, a Wholesome Award, a Progressive Architecture Award. Um, Marie earned her BR, MR, sorry, at MIT and is a registered architect. And I just wanted to say, um, what I remember when I first um, encountered Landing Studio's work, um, it, it sort of seemed like a thesis project that had actually materialized, like this sort of amazing combination. The things that, all, um, especially those of us, Maya and I, probably as part of this, were interested in infrastructure two decades ago and would speculate on how to make infrastructure pro projects public, um, except all of us drew things that never materialized. And so to see Landing Studio actually do this and enact this was kind of amazing. So I look forward to um, having her share her work with us. Thank you. Thank you so much, Lola, for that introduction. Um, I will, I, yeah, I plan to speak about the Rock Shuffle Marine Project and um, so interesting to talk about that. Um, I wanna thank you, Lola and Tara, for the invitation to be here tonight. I'm incredibly honored to have the opportunity to share my work with everyone here um, as part of this lecture series. So I co-lead Landing Studio with my partner, Dan Adams. Um, we're an office of five based in Somerville, Massachusetts, um, which is just outside of Boston. We softly launched our practice in 2005 um, and we're fully up and running by 2011. And since then have had the privilege of working with a little more than a dozen very talented architects that are uh, named here as uh, Landing Studio. Um, I'm calling the presentation tonight, oh, sorry. Um, making infrastructure public uh, because that's the overarching mission of our work. And I wanted to first spend a little bit of time talking about what that means to us. Um, so our work takes many forms. Uh, we're trained as architects, but the project outcomes only sometimes involve buildings. The projects unfold over different time scales from temporary events on industrial docks to weeks and months long lighting installations to small design builds of things like urban farms, street trees, housing renovations, cooling pocket parks, and then to infrastructure transformations that take place over multiple years or even decades, involving significant phases of community visioning, regulatory processes, and construction that's followed by a lifetime of maintenance and care. Our role in all of this is to help steward stakeholder coalitions through these processes, and in that way, making is just as much about physical outcomes for us as it is a process of making. We work with spaces of infrastructure that support the flows of materials, goods, and people. Um, so these are highways, waterways, railways, public works depots, utility corridors that network cities and regions, but have a regrettable legacy of bringing harm to local communities and ecosystems. We believe that infrastructure is never neutral, but it's the physical expression of political and social forces that have historically favored the global over the local and the interests of the powerful over the vulnerable. Um, we also feel that it's important to acknowledge the instrumental role that the building professions of urban design, planning, and engineering have had in perpetuating systems of oppression through infrastructure projects like the Federal Highway Act in the United States. We mostly focus on what we call active infrastructure that is still being used for its purpose, uh, which is different in important ways from post-industrial or infrastructure reuse projects, um, making considerations of operations and environmental impacts front and center in our work. It also foregrounds the challenge of negotiating the interests of many publics more equitably 
as the interests of a larger, usually wealthier and whiter regional public persists as a force to contend with in our local active infrastructure project, projects. So to make it more public as designers and design advocates, we ask ourselves the following questions around people. How can the public spaces of infrastructure reflect the priorities of the populations that are closest to them? What are the processes that need to be in place in order to make this possible? In the environment, how can we reintroduce nature-based processes to lessen harmful environmental climate impacts? How can we facilitate comfortable and safe human scale connections to and through spaces of infrastructure? And then how can we realize the long-term and sustainable use of infrastructural spaces? We believe that architects are the key actors or are key actors in helping to make infrastructure that's more just and sustainable by attending to the human and ecological dimensions of those spaces. Our goal is to make inhospitable environments more healthy, connected and useful and to bring impacted communities into conversations to lead these transformations. The values that guide our work and the design tactics to practice our values have developed over the course of nearly two decades. And so I wanna organize this presentation a bit by talking through how we've learned from and built on ideas from different projects over the years. Um, so this is where it all started for us. This photo was taken 20 years ago in the winter of 2003. Um, and it was the first time that myself and my partner walked into this giant salt yard in Chelsea, um, which is a really small, um, heavily industrial city in Boston Harbor. Um, a lot of what makes Chelsea what it is, both socially and economically, and in terms of its environmental justice challenges, is, is kind of represented in this drawing here. Um, the kind of long tail of the city is a federal navigation channel that brings most of the state's road salt and petroleum and produce um, from the Atlantic up through um, past the city of Boston and into the cities of Chelsea and Revere. And in the black, you can see all of the, the industrial zones of Chelsea. So it entirely lines its waterfront edge and then the residential is in the kind of lighter gray. So it's a heavily dense um, residential municipality. It's actually the smallest in the state at 2.2 square miles. And, um, and it's the most heavily dense um, industrial city. It is a majority minority city. Um, it has a, almost 70% Latino population with um, a large, more than a third of them from Central America. Uh, the overall population is about 40,000 people in Chelsea. And so this is the scale of the ships that bring salt, um, road salt, into, um, into that, that, um, that dock that I was showing a second ago. And then these are the kinds of views that residents see from their street fronts. Um, so this is a, a waterfront horizon of Mexican salt. Uh, Chilean salt sort of colors the horizon differently. And then the Northern Irish salt, which becomes a, a kind of big dark brown wall to the city. And then when the dock itself is, is empty, the views towards downtown Boston are kind of beyond that bridge. And so there's kind of a um, clear tension between the everyday lives of the residents in Chelsea and the industrial activities that consume the entire waterfront and sort of create this barrier between them and this um, natural resource. So our first project in Chelsea was a series of light projections on the salt pile. Um, we had visions of, of kind of emulating the work of Jenny Holzer and then um, the Red Sox won the World Series at the time. And so we were told that it had to be a Go Sox projection at first. And what we were trying to do was really, um, first, you know, we were kind of attracted to the scale of these, these salt piles and wanted to do something that would just engage at that scale and lighting. And the reason why we thought of Jenny Holzer was the fact that light was the only material we could purchase as graduate students that could actually um, produce something at the, the size to kind of uh, be present on, on these, you know, 60 foot tall salt piles. And then as we did it, we started to kind of observe these, these changes taking place, um, that the piles would get carved away with winter storms, 
And then the projections themselves would sort of index that change. And all of a sudden kind of call attention to this, this kind of really dynamic landscape, mountains being made and then disappearing over the course of days um, and weeks and seasons in the city. There was some kind of you know, um, reception of it in the local newspaper in the Boston Globe. Um, some of it was positive, and then some of it was really critical. Um, the, the projections, in a sense, brought to light the environmental conflicts of having these like really heavy industrial activities in um, a very vulnerable neighborhood. And what are all the impacts of the ships, the trucks, all the things kind of flowing in and out of, of Chelsea. So in the meantime, we started to um, work on a longer term project with this, this same salt company. Um, on the left hand side and the lower end, you'll, that's the kind of piles that we were doing projections on. And they had purchased a decommissioned um, oil terminal, which is the, the tanks you see on the right hand side. And um, the kind of the land control problem that was sort of the genesis of this project and a direct result of this tension between the residents of the city and then the industrial businesses were there that were there in this heavily invested in piece of industrial infrastructure, the navigation channel that lines the, the kind of edge there, um, was a real conflict between state regulations, which called for only marine dependent infrastructure along the waterfront of Chelsea in order to take advantage of this somewhat rare infrastructural resource, the, the kind of um, Panamax depth shipping channel. And then the city zoning, which was in direct conflict with that, um, which excluded the uses of, of marine industry on the waterfront, meaning that there was no as of right way to develop um, this, this parcel here. And so that challenge, was really kind of um, something that set the stage for some creative thinking about what the future of this waterfront site could be. And kind of identifying the problem here that the zoning um, at the different scales was, was really viewing this space as an either or. It's either public access or it's industrial. And so the project that we developed um, called Rock Chapel Marine, a key piece of it is called the, the Port Park, um, the publicly organized recreation territory. And I'll talk a little bit about where the, the ideas from that came. So I'm gonna just say also at the same time, something else we were doing, and I wanna just kind of talk about how ideas from different projects were, were kind of filtering into um, our, our thinking and our team's thinking at the time. Um, was working with another facility in Staten Island, same ownership, um, another salt dock right in New York Harbor. And again, this is a picture of the wintertime activities there, um, a Panamax ship unloading. And then in the summertime, it's, it's like a very, very quiet space. There's not a lot of need for road salt. Um, so the pile gets smaller, it's tarped. The employees don't really have as many um, things to do in the summertime. Many of them are seasonal workers. And all of this space all of a sudden opens up on the waterfront. And so we started to work with some arts groups who had approached the salt company and you know, asking, could we possibly use this space to get access to the, the waterfront that we don't, don't have access to? The same exact issue as what's happening in Chelsea. And so for several um, years on a biannual basis, we worked with Staten Island Arts to put on the Lumen Film and Performance Art Festival. And the first couple of times we did it, it was um, our role as the architects and designers of the, the Salt Company was to help find ways to kind of creatively illuminate the space. It's a nearly mile, um, a half mile, sorry, quarter mile long facility. So it's fairly large and very dark at night. And, um, and so we use colorful lighting projections, kind of drawing from things we were learning with doing the projections on the salt piles to kind of in illuminate the industrial relics and create sort of spaces for artists to do in their installations and to bring the, the public and the residents into this for a one night um, activity. And then we, um, uh, a few years went by and all of a sudden it was a very, very um, non-snowy winter. There was a lot of salt that was just left on the dock. And we started to think that 
starting, you know, engaging with the salt itself as a way to create stages and spaces for the artists insula installations would be a really interesting way to start to um, engage with that material. And so this was um, in 2012, and it was the first year that we started to engage with the, the salt dock machine operators to create salt landscapes. And the artists all you know, started to take these things on. The first year, because the salt was a bit of a surprise to everyone, we didn't know that we were gonna be dealing with so much of it. It was done in a really impromptu way. So we have artists that began to kind of incorporate it into their kind of living sculptural, sculptural performances. Um, others who kind of engaged with the material of it themselves and then some who used it as kind of a, a space, um, you know, to create a, a sort of semi-enclosed gallery. Um, and then these are just some images of the, the machine operators using like sort of little hand piles of salt to lay out um, those shapes on the ground on the day before. And then uh, um, a machine operator working with an artist to create a, a base for a sculpture here. So we'll return to those ideas in a little bit. Um, so going back to Chelsea, as we were kind of contending with this issue of, um, you know, our, the client that we were working with wanting to expand their operations, there being no kind of legal way for them to do so, we all started to think about this being this interesting kind of way of representing the salt dock. Um, and the fact that it is a, ch a really changing landscape, it's a very seasonal um, industrial activity, and that there's this space there in the middle, um, which is the summertime uh, um, absence of a salt pile. And that that itself could become an opportunity like it was with the Lumen, Lumen Film and Performance Art Festival to bring in the public in a regular basis to kind of initiate a seasonal ritual of public access within Chelsea's industrial waterfront. And so that, this led to a more formalized kind of plan of that expansion of the salt facility. So the, the kind of older um, facility was here. And the project has a few different zones to it um, that, that were implemented at different times. Um, a main kind of headquarters building for dispatching the trucks. And you can see the, the truck scales here. Um, the kind of center of the project is the salt stockpile. And the seasonal aspect of it is that that central stockpile um, in the w summertime is, is this footprint, and then it expands in the wintertime to take over this space here. In the summertime, this is just an open paved event space and recreational court for basketball. And then the finally on the edge here, this is a year round um, public park on the waterfront that zone of the waterfront is less suitable for industrial use. It's not as deep um, so that you can't berth a ship there. It has a riprap slope and not a constructed bulkhead edge. And so we were able to make a case to the state authorities that there was no um, industrial use that could, that could be supported there. Um, and so we were able to um, kind of carve that piece off as something that would be for public access. And so what happens um, every, every um, October is the salt is, is um, piled on the basketball court like this. Um, and every May, the basketball, the salt is taken off and it's restriped and painted and touched up. And the, the kind of design detail of all of this is just a simple movable fence that can be moved with the, the dock equipment easily um, back and forth between the public access side and then the salt stockpile side. Um, we designed this billboard early on in the first few years of um, the port opening because we wanted to kind of advertise that this new seasonal amenity would be there. Um, and soon enough, uh, kids were climbing under the gates at night and, and um, using the space for basketball and other things. And the, the kind of other tool that enabled this process was a memorandum of agreement between the business, um, the salt company, and the municipality. And we saw this as like a really kind of critical um, learning opportunity ourselves as architects that a policy, a small policy, or a use agreement for a project can really open up um, and, you know, a lot of opportunities to do different things. Um, and to, you know, as architects, we often end up really only having 
really only kind of working on the physical elements of a design, but in industrial and infrastructural spaces, so much of it is about how the space kind of changes over time and the, the kind of influences of being actively used. And so this is the agreement that says every May, this area must be opened up for public use. Every October, it can be used for industrial. And then there's other aspects in there that um, help with neighborhood beautification and other impacts from trucking um, and so on. Uh, the dock itself was built by salt dock workers. And this also draws from some of the experience that we had working directly with the dock workers during the Lumen project, where we learned how, like what the logics were of creating piles. Um, I don't know why this photo is so, so blurry. And um, began to work with them to create, to kind of come up with a, a landscape geometry just using dirt and, and clean soil because it was a contaminated site in the same way that they build salt piles, but at a very small scale. Um, we also used their kind of, the salt company's typical crew of welders and, um, and all of the, the kind of cons uh, uh, subcontractors that they use on their own um, industrial site to help build the park. Meaning that whenever a repair is needed, when maintenance is needed to be done, they know who to call, and they also know how everything is built so that they can repair and, um, and maintain this space easily. Uh, the dock workers also maintain the landscape in the summer months, and the seasonality that allows for public access in the summer is also a labor strategy in the sense that the dock workers are underemployed traditionally in the summer, and this creates a, um, a shift into landscape work and maintenance work um, where they can be employed for the full year. The demolition of the terminal started in 2012, and to celebrate this moment, we did a series, another series of projections on the oil tanks as they were um, dismantled. And the final um, set of projections was a goodbye that, as the tanks were taken down um, and the, the kind of projection itself disappeared. The idea was, again, that we wanted to broadcast that this space was going to be opened up for public use. Um, this is something we've heard on this project and, and many others that we've worked on is that many residents had no idea that they lived in a waterfront city because it was always shielded off either by you know 40 foot tall tanks or a 60 foot tall pile and so this idea of being able to use that space for um, recreational purposes um, and access to the water was something that was completely new uh, we recycled elements of the oil terminal they're built with a certain durability and they weren't really at the end of their um, useful life and so we started to um, through the demolition process, pull these things apart and um, and reinstall them as park supporting elements. So this is the the roof of an oil tank and a retaining dike, creating a waterfront amphitheater. Uh, these are two f foam extinguishing cannons that were turned into spray fountains for kids. And then a truck loading rack, um, which is used as a sort of stage and viewing platform for um, theater and just viewing the waterfront. This is a barge unloading rack uh, that's a viewing platform. And these things then extended into uses um, for theater in the park with the local theater company. And then that local theater use started to expand itself into the salt dock. Uh, this is a production of Hamlet that's using the salt piles as uh, stages and then later production of Midsummer Night's Dream. And then just some pictures. Okay. Uh, so the second project I'm gonna talk about is, um, this is a, a big kind of leftover space from the Big Dig project in Boston, which was a um, sort of generational project to put the central artery elevated highway underground in downtown Boston. Um, the, the kind of less talked about story of the Big Dig project is that it also resulted in these really massive viaduct spaces just north and south of the city. So this is one right just south of downtown Boston that separates the neighborhoods of Chinatown, the South End, and South Boston. Um, 
And we were able in this project, this was sort of our second major project that was realized. And um, we were able to kind of take the ideas and some of the tactics that we had learned in doing the Rock Chapel Marine project with the salt um, and apply them into a different sort of infrastructural setting. But the, some of these lessons about working with active infrastructure, thinking about maintenance, the operations, machine access, and all of those things became really important um, in this project, but in kind of different ways. Um, the kind of main, main kind of intentions of the design was to create access through. So there's sort of three major spines of circulation to create connectivity between those neighborhoods. Um, one of them is a multimodal path, and then we have this boardwalk that sort of meanders more slowly through a um, stormwater retention and treatment landscape that you see here. And this is an image of the boardwalk itself. Uh, we did a lot of work to kind of analyze like what, how much illumination would be actually hitting the ground and able to support vegetation in this space. It's like a sort of unusual site to work with because there's so much overhead activity with all of the viaduct rampways. And then um, used that to, that to start to think about what, where are the places where we can successfully plant plants to filter and hold stormwater, sort of translating that kind of underground pipe network there into a surface treatment of the landscape so that all of the stormwater management is open and exposed um, and something that you can actually see and interact with as you're kind of walking through. Um, on this boardwalk. And so that was, those were parts of the project that were relatively easy to fund. Pathways, stormwater management, um, the boardwalk, they're all kind of transportation infrastructure. Um, one of the major kind of challenges of this project where the other one was about land control. Land control was easy in this project. The Department of Transportation owned all of the land, so there were no issues with that. What was the challenge with this project is that the, it was entirely funded by a Department of Transportation that has very specific guidelines about what they can and cannot um, pay for in their work. And so they can pay for transport, you know, transportation elements, paths, and so on. Um, but they can't pay for parks. So what do we do with all of the extra space under there? It wasn't enough really just to like bring people through, but we wanted to be able to do things beyond um, pathways, trees, benches, and stormwater management. And so we started to um, think about how to, um, you know, go beyond just the transportation oriented um, aspects of what MassDOT does and it, the, the kind of solution to this was really unlocked for us when we started working with um, some of the bridge inspectors at MassDOT um, and un began to understand that they need access to do structural inspections every three months. The concrete, so you can see a crack monitor on the lower left there. Those are placed, I mean, those, those happen kind of throughout this, um, this structure and they use boom lifts um, to visually inspect every inch of the concrete. And we had heard from talking to them that they were having a lot of trouble getting their vehicles into the space because it had been just this kind of loosely um, paved gravel area. And so we started to propose these paved uh, plates that you see those kind of big black figures off of the main circulation spine that could double purpose as areas to get that access with the man lift, but then also support um, other activities like recreational uses. One of them is a basketball court. Um, there's a dog park in the upper right corner and then a, a kind of more flexible event space. Um, so this is a page from the construction documents showing the, the reach access coverage from all of those. Um, and they're all just you know spaced far enough apart to get full coverage of the underpass. And then this is the, a view of one of the smaller um, event spaces kind of overlooking the Fort Point Channel uh, waterfront. The, the kind of um, the tool of developing a use agreement actually came into play in this project as well. Um, a substantial piece of this for MassDOT was funding, um, getting some funding through um, a parking lease, and they used a public-private partnership model to do that. We were able to work with them to embed in their lease model a requirement for the private lease operator to support programming and events, um, a minimum number per year, 
And um, some of the, the visuals on there are showing where some of the support elements for sculpture and um, we have diagrams of where murals could be installed and so on and where the kind of electrical infrastructure is for events and so on. Um, so that to ensure that there could be um, more active use here. Also, the private operator was in charge of doing landscape maintenance, which is something that the local, that MassDOT wasn't capable of doing. So it allowed us to kind of expand the palette of planting and things that we could do there. Um, one thing that's just kind of fun about this project is something we call like hacking the special provisions. Um, down a little bit further away, it's a very kind of large project. Um, some of the, the kind of design that we did was just about creating a more safe and kind of playful and active um, human scaled um, pedestrian crossings um, underneath the highway bridges. And so we came up, we worked with a, a community advisory group as sort of part of MassDOT's process uh, to come up with these things we called the dinosaurs, which had, um, which were kind of steel pipe structures outfitted with a different, um, all these different types of lighting. Um, theatrical lights sort of as their eyeballs and their arms kind of held a pedestrian scale light and then there was some underlighting that created these these shadows on the infrastructure and what's really interesting in working with a really large state agency like this is as soon as you go through a really rigorous design process with them and you have their engineering review for structures and accessibility and maintenance access and all of these kind of hoops you have to jump through then that element is incorporated in their special provisions, which means that any other project could um, build a dinosaur as part of their project anywhere else in the state of Massachusetts. And they don't have to go through all of those design steps and review processes in order to do that. And so we thought that was a really kind of exciting prospect of working within a infrastructure agency is that they do so much building that it becomes very standardized and you can start to tap into these systems and leverage you know, smaller design moves to have larger impacts. Although we haven't seen those pop up anywhere, so it's not really a, a proven, proven concept yet. Um, the next project that I'm gonna talk about is called Charles Gate. Um, and this is a really important site in Boston. Um, it is the, the kind of, um, terminus of the Emerald Necklace Park system that was designed by Frederick Law Olmsted that was, um, you know, for all intents and purposes, destroyed um, in the highway era with the construction of the Boker overpass. You can see an image of that construction um, on the left and that in the context of all of the other um, urban renewal projects in Boston that were happening at that time. Um, this is a project that was um, kind of led by a community coalition of open space advocates and, and residents. And they came together because they knew there was this, this kind of problem in their neighborhood um, under the overpass. I'll show some pictures in a, in a second. It was just this like very dead, uninviting space, um, very neglected and something that people felt unsafe passing through. And so they had gotten a small amount of grant funding to come up with a plan um, that we worked on that plan with them for a year and um, came up with a vision. And this got the attention of all of the um, city and state partners who all have kind of an ownership role in this, this property. It's, it's a kind of complicated ownership space. And what was really interesting is that by having this plan in place, um, we were able to shift two bridge repair projects because these, these structures that were built in the 1950s were coming to the end of their, um, active, their, their useful life. Um, so the, the kind of areas that are outlined in, in red there and there. And take what would have been two $25 million bridge replacement in kind projects. By in kind, um, that's kind of mass dot speak for we're going to rebuild this bridge exactly how it was built in the 1950s, even though it disconnects the Emerald Necklace from the Charles River. It you know causes the, all of these ecological harms and, and creates all these unsafe spaces. By having the community plan present and getting attention with that, MassDOT found out about it and we were able to start working with them. They actually hired us to be on their design team and transform that project into something that only rebuilt those two areas outlined to actually something that 
eliminated all of the road work that's highlighted in red there. Um, and it went from two $25 million projects to what is now a $170 million project to completely transform this intersection here at this kind of critical linkage of the Emerald Necklace to the Charles River. So these are some of the images of like those, high, those um, roadway removals that are part of this project. This is the mouth of the Muddy River now open to the Charles River. Um, this is a ramp that will be removed over the Muddy River as part of the project. And then this is um, where the mouth of the river again will be opened up. This is a project that's um, in about a 25% design phase, and that sounds like nothing. We've been working on it since 2017. Um, but because of all of the, the kind of negotiation of how to um, sort of leverage the bridge repair projects for these bigger um, transformations, so much of the work has been done at this point. It's It really has been like a very planning heavy project. And it's, you know, something that we've, we feel very proud is a big achievement um, to go to a kind of pedestrian first, a people powered transportation first model for um, a state agency that tends to really um, think about it uh, from the perspective of automobiles. So these are some of the, the kind of um, engagements that we were in that first year of kind of coming up with a concept design, doing walking tours of the site. Um, our partners, our neighborhood partners and conservancy partners are, do these every week um, to this, you know, still to this year. Again, meeting with maintenance crews. And a big part of the project was also trying to really figure out what exactly was the problem. Um, I mean, you know, it's obvious that there's a big highway or a big roadway that goes over a park here, um, but it wasn't really the whole thing. This is what the Muddy River looks like underneath. And something that we found that was really interesting is we started to kind of dig into the project archives um, that the state has in terms of when the overpass was first constructed and the, this ed end of the emerald necklace was, was um, you know, dissolved, is that, that there actually was a park that was designed as part of this at that time. And that seemed like this interesting thing to us because we hear a lot about like under highway parks today, but I, you know, frankly hadn't really known that that was happening all the way back in the, in the highway era. And so we, this is the construction drawing of that park um, that we just illustrated to show um, a, the different view of it. And as we kind of started to analyze the drawings, we started to see some of the reasons why um, it had been erased over time. I mean, if you go back to this image here, none of that wall in the back was part of the park, but otherwise all of the things that are called out in this design, plants, trees, benches, like these custom um, elements were completely gone by um, 2017 when we started. And some of the reasons was that it was designed completely without any reference to this massive piece of infrastructure that was above it. Um, you can, if you really look carefully here, it says 80,000 Pakisandra, that's, uh, and that is in a space that's directly underneath a bridge. Um, so they, they provided it with irrigation, but there was really no thinking that, you know, about the survivability of these things over time and, Every time any kind of bridge maintenance work had to be done, a bench was taken out because it was hard to get to. Um, a tree was taken out. And over time, over the years, it became nothing. Um, and the community you know, really never knew exactly why this was, was happening. Even a river restoration project, these are some construction documents from an um, ecological restoration project that actually called for the removal of trees, benches, and steps, all of these elements that make the park accessible. And so in, in kind of doing this research, we learned that Again, that this this kind of idea of being able to maintain access and think about maintenance in a creative way is so critical to the the ability for these landscapes to thrive. Um, it's also a very multi-jurisdictional landscape, as I mentioned earlier. This is all of the ownership that happens there. All of that becomes incredibly visible through the management of water. Um, so we have state transportation water right now that is passing directly into, um, into the Muddy River and resulting in some of those um, algae blooms that you're seeing. 
And so we started to do these maps of um, who owns all of the water infrastructure on the site. And so every single color on this drawing is a different combination of ownership. Um, so I think there's seven different combinations, seven colors that you see here between city, um, state transportation, st state um, Department of Conservation and Recreation. And this was another kind of major discovery for us as a reason for why the site had become so neglected over time is no one knew whose responsibility anything was. Um, and everybody accused everyone else of, um, of being responsible. And so nothing ever happened there, including um, any kind of, you know, um, um, uh, best practices for stormwater management and so on. So we actually spent almost the entire time of, of COVID lockdown actually working with agency partners to start to disentangle those um, water management um, um, landscapes and think about ways that we could separate them by jurisdiction, which ecologically I wouldn't say is like the ideal solution to have a separate stormwater treatment for every single owner on the site. But it became something that like very clearly was necessary in order for everyone to know what they owned and then to be able to take care of what they owned. And so this became a kind of driving characteristic of the, the project. So now you only see three colors, whereas it was um, seven before. Um, and so a lot of the design here was kind of, you know, borrowing from that previous project and thinking about how do you kind of create landscape systems that um, support the infrastructure? What are the maintenance access pathways that can sort of double function as um, circulation through the park and so on? And then um, I'm going to show uh, two more quick things. Um, this is this project is called Malden River Works, and I spoke about this with um, uh, many of you earlier this afternoon. Um, this is a project that was prompted by something called the, the Leventhal City Prize, and the, the kind of central goal of the prize was to support projects that uh, foregrounded equitable resilience. And so that was a really um, interesting prompt for a project. I started this as a faculty member at MIT. I was approached by a group that had been doing work in Malden, um, some environmental advocates and people working on water quality. And um, you know, the, the kind of genesis of this project differently than the others was how do you, like what do, like how do you create an equitable process um, to realize some kind of new, you know, or physical improvement? Um, and I'll get into like what the physical part of this project was in a second, but the, you know, in the chart, in this, in this, the real kind of, um, you know, learning for us, was to say from the very beginning of a project, how do you put a structure in place so that the process and the conversations are led by the people who are actually affected by project outcomes? Malden is another uh, majority minority city. Um, it's the most diverse, um, racially diverse high school in the state of Massachusetts. It's experiencing a housing crisis like everyone around Boston. And its civic leadership does not um, resemble the, um, the residents. Um, and so the, the project was, how do we put together a, um, a group of resident leaders of color that can, that can actually um, drive the course of a project? And we came up um, working with some residents early on. So Marsha Manong was the, the first person in addition with um, someone, uh, some environmental advocates and then someone from the city to come up with this um, idea of a steering committee that would work with a project team. We'd have overlap and feedback between the two. The idea of the steering committee um, who would be compensated by the, the Leventhal Prize uh, was to kind of establish the goals and the direction of the project and then the, the team, um, the project team below would be ch in charge of the kind of day-to-day -day implementation of this project. Um, so we would meet weekly, we would work on, um, you know, all of the logistics of doing community outreach and engagement, but the steering committee themselves would be the ones who say like, yes, we are actually hearing what the communities are saying. No, we're not. We're reaching the, the people that we need to, to reach, um, that the project is really reflecting what we want it to be. Um, so these are some of the early meetings and site visits here, some of the early engagement. The winning the, pro winning the or starting with this um, 
this kind of seed funding from MIT allowed us to do a year-long engagement process. And at the end of it, we, we created this document that um, sort of um, described you know, the entire concept process. It has an appendix that has all of the comments that were made in every meeting, and we've kind of carefully gone through and addressed everything, what we can, what we can't do and so on, so that we have a record that we can be accountable to in terms of um, how the design can change and what the values are in the project as we move forward, knowing that this was, again, going to be a very long project, um, another kind of uh, sort of infrastructure change project. So the, the project site is Malden's, Malden's Department of Public Works. The site is really in a state of disrepair. Um, it's on Malden um, River and um, and here are some pictures of it. They have no stormwater management system at all. They have an uncovered salt pile, which is a real hazard for the fresh water body. Uh, a lot of materials, you know, storage and so on. And they're an essential, and then this is a picture of the Malden River, which again, no one knows is there because the whole river is, um, because of a, a kind of generation of industrial use, is all privately owned um, light industrial businesses that provide no public access. So this is the only city-owned parcel, um, and the idea was to uh, create a public park that would help also protect the DPW from the effects of climate change. Um, the DPW as being a second responder in climate emergencies by doing tree re you know, removal and um, snow um, and de-icing and everything in the wintertime, it's really important for them to be able to be protected from sea level rise so that it's an elevated park that um, that uh, protects from sea level rise and also does the stormwater management for the, the DPW yard. So a big piece of this project was kind of taking some of the technical um, lessons from doing the Rock Chapel Marine and reconfiguring all of the material storage, thinking about truck routing and trying to do it in such a way that was much more kind of coordinated with bringing in uh, public access to the waterfront so that it's safe and that the truck activities are separated from passenger vehicles as well as people and kids trying to get to the, the river. Um, and this is a view of the, the more kind of current design here, um, which has uh, a boathouse for community rowing, a lawn and a restored kind of river shoreline there. And then I'll end on this uh, project. This is uh, what we call the, the Marginal Community Industry Corridor. And this is basically everything we've been doing in Chelsea besides the Rock Chapel Marine project, which is um, what you see here and the, the first one that I started with. Um, so this is something that's kind of unfolded over the last 15 years or so, which are these like small scale, very incremental design build um, projects where we work directly with contractors to do small improvements to kind of better the relationship of this kind of residential community that's directly uh, across um, the street from a very heavy industrial uh, waterfront. And so um, this has involved putting in over 200 street trees uh, along the edge of the salt pile and in a lot of other um, sites along the corridor, um, vines along the fence um, to the industrial property, um, some housing renovations. These are historic Captain Row houses that overlook the water um, from an in earlier industrial era, some other um, housing renovations. Um, during COVID, we converted the Port Park into a food hub because there was a huge f food emergency in Chelsea. And it, like the, the fact that we had embedded a lot of extra electrical infrastructure there for um, theater in the park actually lent itself to all of the coolers for um, the food hub. Uh, other pocket parks that are, um, this one is located on a, a pipe easement next to um, the salt piles where you can kind of get a view of the working waterfront. Uh, feral cat shelters and a junkyard here. And then a urban agriculture um, center here um, that we did a few years ago that has led to this project, which is the renovation of a small warehouse space into a um, community a teaching kitchen. Uh, so we started this uh, process back in um, the winter of 22, I believe, or, or 21. 
Um, this was formerly a horse stable, and then uh, the proposal is to be a community teaching kitchen. Uh, that's one side of it, and that's currently under construction. And then I'll end on this little corner plaza, which we um, is a, um, a really heavily used bus stop to get into East Boston and downtown Boston from Chelsea, uh, but had been used as kind of an overflow car parking area for a used car lot. And so we worked with the salt company again in this case to create like a kind of cooling um, pocket park and bus stop here. You know, see some people um, getting on the bus and that is the end of the presentation. So I wanna thank you all very much for the opportunity.